Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, How Community Hospital Labs Can Perform Comprehensive Genomic Profiling with the Support of Professional Clinical Interpretation Services. I'm Alexis Kraus of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Kyogen. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit their website at kyogen.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Dr. Cheryl Elkin, Chief Scientific Officer, Kyogen Digital Insights, and Dr. Linda Call, Director of Scientific and Clinical Operations at Kyogen Digital Insights. Dr. Elkin, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. The era of precision medicine has led to a revolution in cancer treatment. Historically, cancer was treated based on the organ of origin and treatment protocols often varied widely depending on the institution where the patient was treated. However, cancers that originate in the same organ can be driven by different genetic alterations. The advent of molecular diagnostics and targeted therapy changed the landscape of cancer treatment, suggesting that cancers that originate in the same organ could be treated effectively with different therapies based on their particular molecular profile. Similarly, cancers that originate in different organs can share genetic drivers. So cancers in different organs with the same drivers may be most effectively treated using the same targeted molecular therapy. These observations led to the development of increasingly complex molecular tests that identify the molecular changes in the tumor, allowing a physician to target that tumor with a specific therapy. Over the last 20 years, the number of identified cancer drivers, as well as the targeted therapies available to address those molecular drivers, has increased exponentially. As a result, the molecular diagnostic testing has also grown from individual gene sequencing to large-scale next-generation sequencing, known as NGS, examining panels of genes from 50 to hundreds or even thousands of genes. The adoption of larger and larger comprehensive panels has led to an increase in the amount of data requiring interpretation. The larger the panel, the larger the number of novel variants that will be uncovered in each test. NGS testing is being expanded beyond small panels for specific cancers to larger pan-cancer panels to, discuss, to cover disease-agnostic approved drugs as well as off-label and investigational drugs. All of these drivers are leading to a projected increase in the cost of interpretation as a proportion of the test cost. In 2018, the cost of interpretation represented approximately 33% of the cost of the test. However, by 2026, it is projected to represent 56% of the cost of a test. Interpre interpretation is a complex endeavor as customers use many different panels and chemistries. The comprehensive cancer panels are becoming more and more ubiquitous across the market as they can be used for any cancer type and can detect many different types of alterations, SNVs, indels, CNVs, and structural variants, as well as MSI. These panels have also have, also, also have sufficient sequencing coverage to calculate tumor mutational burden. These large panels are being utilized across cancer types for both solid tumors and hematological malignancies, and the interpretation burden is significant as the number of variants that emerge from these panels is significantly greater than the number of variants from a small targeted panel. And while there are some markers whose interpretation is applicable across tumor types, other biomarkers require disease-specific interpretation to highlight evidence that is specific to a variant within a specific disease. The comprehensive cancer panels present unique challenges to the laboratories who must filter and annotate the variants detected and to the physicians who receive the reports. With such large numbers of variants, a lab director or pathologist must prioritize and distinguish clinically relevant variants from passengers and variants of unknown significance. 
In order to make some of these assessments, the lab requires access to current information on clinical guidelines, drug approvals, and ongoing studies in a field where the body of literature is expanding rapidly. The lab needs a process or method for consistent and re reproducible variant interpretation following the published guidelines from AMP and ACMG. The lab needs to be able to provide disease-specific interpretation of microsatellite instability and tumor mutational burden. The lab needs clinical scientists to perform all these activities and needs to scale the interpretation across multiple indications. And it needs to do all of these things quickly in order to meet a clinically relevant turnaround time. Let's look more closely at why clinical interpretation is so important. Over the last 20 years, the number of different treatment options for patients has grown exponentially. However, only a small percentage of cases qualifies for an FDA-approved therapy based on a biomarker. Looking at 100,000 cases that NF1 has reported on over the last eight years, in 16% of cases, an FDA-approved therapy, targeted therapy, is the most applicable option. This number may even be an overestimate in most types of cancer, as non-small cell lung cancer has, an higher, has a higher than average percentage of cases with an approved targeted therapy. And this 20, 20 to 25% is going to increase even further with the recent approval of the KRAS G12C targeted therapy. In 21% of cases, there are no targeted therapies that were appropriate for a patient. But in the center of the curve, 63% of cases could qualify for a clinical trial or off-label use of a therapy. These are the cases with the most critical need for disease-specific clinical interpretation because identification of the variant alone is not sufficient to support a clinical decision. The physician needs to know whether that specific variant is likely to predict sensitivity to a therapy, what is the evidence that the variant is actionable, what is the evidence to support the use of the therapy in that disease type, and what clinical trials are available that the patient could access. With the advent of comprehensive cancer panels, the number of variants to assess is even larger than it has been in the past. To summarize, Cancer genomics and interpretation plays a critical role in precision medicine for oncology. Next generation sequencing helps to identify the molecular alterations that occur in a tumor, and interpretation of the sequencing results helps to separate likely drivers from passenger mutations. Analysis of the potential driver mutations helps physicians to match the alterations to therapies that can target those changes, supported by disease-specific evidence that supports the therapy selection. Kaijin's precision insights can help with the analysis required to identify evidence-based therapies based on identified alterations. So what is precision insights? QCI Precision Insights is a professional clinical interpretation service that complements the uh, user interface in QCI Interpret and Kyogen's other bioinformatics solutions. QCI Precision Insights provides human analysis and expert interpretation, helping to expedite report preparation for small and large panels in both common cancers and rare cancer types. Precision Insights triages and summarizes content for lab director review to assist in report writing, identifying the key pieces of evidence from the literature, and preparing written summaries for review. Precision Insights is powered by the Kyogen Group that was formerly known as NF1. So who is NF1? NF1 has been in business for nearly 13 years, and we have grown and evolved with the field of precision medicine. We were founded in 2008 and began working directly with physicians and their patients to help them to identify the most appropriate molecular test for their tumors, get the test done, and then explain the results. What is the role or function of each mutation identified, and what is the impact of that mutation in the patient's specific cancer type? Through the process of working with individual patients, N of one established a large knowledge base of biomarkers, genes and variants, in the context of different cancer types linked with drugs that had emerging or established evidence that they could target those biomarkers. In 2012, we began working with large hospital systems and commercial laboratories, taking in the results of patient molecular tests and providing reports. 
By 2016, we had partnered with, with over 30 clinical laboratories to provide clinical interpretation, establishing ourselves as a leading clinical interpretation business. And in 2019, we joined Kyogen, bringing together N of one somatic clinical interpretation expertise with Kyogen's bioinformatic computational and curation expertise. At this point, N of one has generated reports for over 250,000 patient cases, covering over 200,000 unique variants across a thousand genes and over a thousand subtypes of cancer. These numbers are out of date as soon as I say them, as our knowledge base continues to grow and expand each day. In 2020, N of One, now QCI Precision Insights, expanded to offer our service to Europe with coverage of EU-specific drug approvals, guidelines, and clinical trials. So why do our partners like N of One? Our reports are prepared by an experienced team of PhD scientists supported by a team of practicing oncologists. And we rely on people, process, and technology. We have a sophisticated knowledge base with proprietary curation tools that help our scientists to curate the literature efficiently and accurately, utilizing a method of knowledge engineering that facilitates efficient and accurate report generation. Our process, both curation and software development, is controlled by a quality management system, ensuring high quality and reproducibility. Our product is highly scalable, because of both our knowledge engineering and the economies of scale derived from working with many clients, we are able to return reports quickly and expedite the sign-out process for our clients who can simply review and sign out their reports. We integrate securely and seamlessly with our clients using either SFTP or web services and can integrate with any bioinformatics solution. The Precision Insights interpretation is powered by the Precision Insights knowledge base, which has been assembled over 10 years of manual expert clinical interpretation. The data in the knowledge base is de-identified. Our clients are not required to submit any protected health information. The knowledge base includes information on all kinds of biomarkers, including SNVs, indels, fusions, CNVs, as well as support for microsatellite instability, or MSI, and tumor mutational burden, TMB. The knowledge base includes guidelines, clinical trials, and drug label information for both the U.S. and EU, with expansion capability for any drug approval agency. The knowledge base also supports variant, gene, and disease level interpretation, as well as multivariant analysis. To dive a little bit more deeply into how all this is done, QCI Precision Insights employs a team of full-time PhD scientists who are trained to our curation process. All scientists undergo rigorous training to the Precision Insights manual and curation criteria, including defined practices for analysis and interpretation of scientific studies. Scientists are trained to evaluate criteria including study size, overall experimental design, validity and accuracy of methods, results, and conclusions. All clinical content is reviewed by a member of N of One's team of practicing oncologists who work with the team on a part-time basis. The work is managed through proprietary workflow software, and all practices, including curation and software development, are governed by a quality management system, as I mentioned earlier. The knowledge base is updated on a daily basis, actually a minute-to-minute -minute basis, with new evidence from the literature. New drug approvals and guideline updates are generally updated within a business day of the information becoming publicly available. All the information included in Precision Insights reports is reviewed on at least an annual basis. Some information is reviewed more frequently, depending on the volume of the literature in that particular field. Clinical trials are sourced primarily from clinicaltrials.gov and from the WHO Clinical Trial Database. Trials are updated on a nightly basis from clinicaltrials.gov and on a periodic basis from the WHO and other sources. So what do these reports look like? At this point, we'd like to walk through a full case to show you the content provided by Precision Insights. This is an example case of a 51-year-old woman with AML. The reports shown here are very detailed and information rich, showing in PDF format the most detailed information that Precision Insights provides. 
Most of our clients receive this information in XML format via API, giving them the flexibility to, discipl- to display as much or as little of the supporting information as they prefer. The laboratories still have the supporting information that can be supplied as an appendix or included in a portal or used for reference to answer questions about the underlying data. For today's purposes, we will walk through the most detailed version of a report. The reports are structured based on the guidelines for reporting of somatic variants in cancer described in Lee et al. 2017 um, and the AMP ASCO CAP publication. The variants are organized in tiers, as described by Lee et al., where tier one represents variants of strong clinical significance, tier two, variants of potential clinical significance, tier three, variants of unknown clinical significance, and tier four, benign variants. In this case, there are two tier one mutations. FLT3 has level A or tier one evidence supporting two FDA-approved drugs, mitostorin and gelteritinib. Both FLT3 and NPM1 are also associated with level A prognostic significance. For mutations that are associated with drug sensitivity, the summary section of the report includes the gene, the variant, therapies approved to target this alteration in this indication, therapies approved in other indications with LOE in parentheses, and the and whether or not trials are available, as well as whether the specific variant is associated with resistance to any therapies. Levels of evidence are identified for drugs associated with variants and indicated in parentheses, as I've, as I've shown, as well as prognostic and diagnostic significance predominantly in uh, hematologic disorders. Clinical guidelines from NCCN, ESMO, WHO, and ELN are included where they are relevant. In this case, there are ELN guidelines associated with both FLT3 internal tandem duplication and the NPM1 alteration, as well as a BCOR alteration. Interactions between the variants are shown. In heme disorders, co-occurring variants can have differential effects on prognosis, The interaction is described on a report level in the summary section of the report, but is also reflected in the content on the individual variants. In this case, the co-occurrence of FLT3 and NPM1 results in a different prognostic significance than the occurrence of either variant alone. This information is summarized in the interaction summary, including references for the evidence cited. Behind the front page, Detailed biomarker information is included. Text is written by PhD scientists based on curated literature describing the impact of each alteration on molecular function, disease-specific biological and clinical relevance, and clinical evidence from the literature. So at this point, we'd like to walk through the content included for one variant. In this case, there is an activating FLT3 mutation an internal tandem duplication. So the biomarker results summary shown at the top indicates the take home message for the, for the information about this variant. What kind of mutation is it? What does it do to the gene? What effects does that have biologically? And are there any drugs available to target it? Or does it have any pro- significant or important prognostic or diagnostic significance. Every sentence is supported by a literature, I'm sorry, a a literature reference that's immediately um, referenceable by the PMID. In this case, FLT3 ITD is shown to be an activating mutation. Um, Mitostorin and gelteritinib are approved by the FDA for FLT3 positive AML and other FLT3 inhibitors are in clinical development. Each subsequent section gets more and more detailed. The biological relevance section, the first portion, describes the molecular function of the variant. What does it do and what is the evidence? In this case, FLT3 internal tandem duplication has been shown to lead to activation of multiple signaling pathways. It results in ligand-independent dimerization and activation. The section below describes the incidence of the, g- of the gene in this disease type. This data is derived from COSMIC and the TCGA via the CBIO portal, but also curated from the literature to um, 
to ensure that there are no biases from the cosmic or CBIO data. The next section is called clinical relevance, and this section provides information for both cancer in general and this disease specifically. And if there is very specific information about this variant, it can be included here as well. The first section, role in disease, describes the, the role that this gene plays in cancer. And in this case, FLT3 is an oncogene. It's associated with the transformation of myeloid cells. The next section um, describes the, the next sections describe the effect on drug sensitivity, drug resistance, and prognosis. And this section includes the multivariant analysis. So FLT3 is associated with poor prognosis in normal karyotype AML, but in combination with NPM1 has an intermediate prognosis. And you can see that in this, in the prognostic significance section, the the annotation has been specifically modified to include reference to the concurrent NPM1 mutation that's been reported in this case, affecting the prognosis um, for this patient with both mutations. The effect on drug sensitivity section discusses sensitivity to tyrosine kinase inhibitors, including the approval of mitostorin and gelteritinib by the FDA for AML. The clinical evidence section gets into incredibly deep detail, and this section is providing summaries of specific data from clinical trials supporting the summary information that came earlier. It is specific to AML, the disease for this patient, and organized by the phase of the clinical trial from which the data is derived. In any case, the highest level data for each, any given drug is provided. So for example, we don't show phase one data for a drug for which we are presenting phase two data. We only show preclinical data if it's very specific for the disease or the variant or for a new or novel therapy that has already advanced into clinical trials. This for each piece of information shown on this page describes an individual clinical trial and result. The reports also show a list of sample therapies, including the name, the brand name, if the drug has been approved, the level of evidence targeting this specific alteration in this disease, the target or rationale for use, and the highest level of clinical development in any disease type. So for example, um, gilteritinib and mitostorin have both been FDA approved for FLT3 positive AML. Other drugs, including um, serafinib, have been advanced through phase three in, um, in AML, but have been FDA approved in other diseases such as hepatocellular carcinoma and thyroid carcinoma. The clinical trials are also displayed in the report. These trials come primarily from clinical trials in the WHO, clinicaltrials.gov and the WHO, as mentioned earlier, but also from a few private sources. The trials are matched based on a single biomarker or based on multiple biomarkers and can be prioritized by institution. As you can see here, two lists of five trials each are provided for each biomarker, both filtered for age, gender, disease, and molecular eligibility, and then subjected to different prioritization rules. The first is filtered by clinical specificity, or prioritized by clinical specificity, which includes the specificity for the disease, for the particular variant, or the type of variant within a gene. The other list, the geographic specificity, list shows trials that are closest to the patient location at the top. Um, and the patient location can be communicated either as the state that the patient resides in or the zip code of the physician. So now that you've seen the content available through Precision Insights, I'd like to pass to Linda, who will highlight the importance of the disease specificity of this information. Thanks, Cheryl. So cancers are most often classified based on two factors, the organ of origin or the primary site of the tumor and the histology of the tumor. The histology refers to the type of cell that composes the cancer. 
For example, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, neuroendocrine carcinoma, sarcoma, et cetera. The specific classification of cancer is important because different cancer types may respond differently to the same therapies. Also, cancers that originate in the same organ can be very different cancers. Taking ovarian cancer as an example here, most ovarian cancers are epithelial, but there are ovarian cancers that originate in cord or stromal cells or in germ cells. These tumors tend to have different drivers and different response rates than epithelial tumors. Even epithelial tumors can be divided into specific subtypes, such as serous, endometrioid, clear cell, and mucinous, and serous carcinoma can be high grade or low grade. The specificity of the diagnosis that is submitted to Chiagen is directly related to the specificity, specificity of the information that is returned in a report. A case submitted with a diagnosis of lung adenocarcinoma will return information specific to lung adenocarcinoma. However, for a case submitted with a diagnosis of a more general lung cancer, the case could be small cell or non-small cell carcinoma, or it could be a lung carcinoid, for example. Even within non-small cell lung carcinoma, these cases could be adenocarcinoma, squamous cell, or large cell lung carcinoma. In the case of a general diagnosis like lung cancer, the system will return more and less specific information to cover all possibilities of the diagnosis. To show a few more examples, in the left column, we have general disease terms, including sarcoma and myeloid neoplasm. These general terms encompass many diverse cancer types. Sarcomas can be soft tissue or bony, and many, such as Ewing sarcoma, have very specific pathognomonic diagnostic driver mutations. The diagnostic levels of evidence will be very specific to the diagnosis. For example, an EWSR1 Fly1 fusion has level A diagnostic evidence for Ewing sarcoma, but not for other sarcoma types. Myeloid neoplasm encompasses a wide variety of specific diagnoses, including AML, MDS, and MPN, as well as specific subtypes within these diagnoses. The prognostic significance of a variant will vary based on the specific diagnosis. The more specific the submitted diagnosis, the more accurate and specific the level of evidence and tier classification of the variant. In some situations, a general diagnosis is appropriate. There are times that an oncologist or pathologist is unable to determine a specific diagnosis. For example, a metastasis may be detected without identification of the original primary tumor. Pathology results may be unavailable or inconclusive. A case may be so urgent that the interpretation is required in advance of a specific diagnosis. In some cases, the molecular results may be needed to confirm or refine a diagnosis. Finally, in some cases, a set of symptoms may be submitted to the lab without a confirmed diagnosis at all. In the event that a specific diagnosis cannot be obtained, the case may be submitted with a more general term. However, there are trade-offs. Therapies that are approved in a very specific disease could be listed as approved in another indication on the report. Uh, the levels of evidence for the general disease particularly for prognostic and diagnostic evidence, may be lower than for the specific disease, since the significance of a biomarker is often tied to the specific diagnosis. The guidelines and trials presented may be less specific, and the trials presented will likely be different. Um, in general, the report overall is likely to be longer to cover more possibilities, and will contain more information about general and related diseases. Cheryl showed you a few reports that had quite a bit of extensive information, so you can imagine that for a general disease, we like to include different disease types that fall under that heading, so you can see how the, the content uh, would, could be quite lengthy for a general disease type. Let's look at a few examples. So this is a comparison of a case with a RUNX1 and an ASXL1 mutation with the submitted diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia or myeloid neoplasm compared with myeloid neoplasm. The first thing you'll notice is that the myeloid neoplasm report has a lot more text, which I just referred to. The yellow highlights indicate text that describes guidelines in MDS and MPN, other types of myeloid diseases. 
In the event that the diagnosis is unclear, the MDS and MPN information could be relevant for the patient once a diagnosis has been confirmed. For the AML report, in contrast, only the guidelines specifically related to AML are presented. You'll also notice that the levels of evidence are different. ASXL1 and RUNX1 both have level A prognostic significance in AML, and RUNX1 is also a level A diagnostic marker in AML. However, the levels of evidence in myeloid neoplasm are indicated as level C because these markers are less significant in other types of myeloid malignancies, and these markers are not specifically diagnostic of one specific malignancy. The level of evidence is dependent on the specific disease. In a second example, we consider a case with a MET exon 14 skipping mutation with the diagnosis of either non-small cell lung carcinoma or cancer not otherwise specified. The tier classification of the MET variant is tier 1A in non-small cell lung carcinoma, where there are two FDA-approved drugs, tapotinib and capmatinib, that are specifically approved for this alteration in non-small cell lung cancer. However, for the more general classification of cancer not otherwise specified, the MET exon 14 skipping mutation is a tier 2C variant. The drugs are only on label if the diagnosis is non-small cell lung cancer. While rare in other cancer types, MET exon 14 skipping mutations have been reported in other cancer types, and the targeted therapies would be considered off-label in this context. Additionally, the NCCN guidelines are disease-specific as well, so they are included for the non-small cell lung cancer diagnosis, but not for the general cancer diagnosis. In the third example, we consider a case where the disease subtype can make a difference in the presentation of the report. Breast cancer is a disease with molecular subtypes based on hormone receptor and HER2 status that is typically determined at the time of diagnosis. The submission of the hormone receptor and HER2 status as a part of the diagnosis can affect the specificity of the report. In this comparison, we look at a case with an ERB-B2 mutation, L755S, and a CDKN2A mutation. For a breast cancer case that is defined as ER positive and HER2 positive, the interpretation can be tailored to that specific subtype. For example, neratinib is approved for HER2 positive breast cancer, so it appears in the approved in this indication column. The level of evidence is C.2, as neratinib is being tested in clinical trials to target L755S, but it is not specifically approved in the context of this mutation. The CDK4-6 inhibitors, such as palbocyclib and ribocyclib, appear in the other indications column because they are approved in the context of ER positive HER2 minus breast cancer. The guidelines associated with HER2 positive breast cancer are presented in a statement explaining the potential resistance impact of the L755S mutation to, to lapatinib is included as well. For the more general breast cancer case, it is assumed to be HER2 minus and ER positive as this is the most common breast cancer subtype. As a result, neratinib appears in the other indication columns, and the CDK4-6 inhibitors are listed as approved in this indication. In this example, no guidelines are presented. So in summary, Precision Insights offers a reliable and rapid system to provide disease-specific and actionable clinical interpretation. The diagram on this slide shows the workflow. The customer performs the molecular diagnostic tests and submits them in XML format, along with as specific as possible a disease or di di diagnosis to the Kyogen integration server. The server pings the knowledge base to retrieve the variant and disease-specific information, which triggers on-demand curation when contracted and necessary, and assembles the report, which is transferred back to the customer. The whole process is platform agnostic and secure, and the XML report allows the customer maximum flexibility to design their own report. Precision Insight customers save time and receive reliable results. One of our customers discusses the reliability of the results in the first quote, and they're trusting Kyogen for thorough and thoughtful analysis, as well as availability to discuss the science in the event of any questions. Another customer has found that the reports to be reliable and consistent, allowing them to save 
85 to 90% of the time they had been spending on case preparation. In conclusion, we've told you today about the key components of QCI precision insights and the importance of disease specificity for accurate interpretation. Precision insights provides expert curated variant and disease specific interpretation, saving time and providing up to date, reliable, and consistent information. With that, we thank you for your attention and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Elkin and Dr. Call for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question, what happens if we can't decide between two diagnoses? Sure, I, I can take this one, this is Linda. Um, if, if you're unable to decide which diagnosis code might be the most appropriate, you can send an email to our support team and we will help you choose the correct code. Um, as we mentioned um, earlier, we do offer some more general high-level codes for cases where the precise diagnosis is unknown. Um, for example, in the case of a myeloid disorder, you know, sometimes the specific diagnosis is unknown early on. Uh, you could submit a case with a code for myeloid neoplasm. And in that case, we would return information for the most common disorders, such as AML, MDS, and MTN. Great. Thank you, Dr. Call. Our next question. Is there a specific list of diagnoses that we select from when submitting a case to Precision Insights? And as a follow-up question to that, what happens if we have a case with a diagnosis that is not on the Precision, precision Insights list? Sure, I, I can take that one as well. Um, we, we do provide an updated list of SNOMED light codes um, monthly to our clients. Um, so you would have a list uh, from which to choose when you were submitting a case to us. Um, and for the follow-up, um, if, if you don't see a diagnosis code on the list, uh, you would reach out to our support team and we will find and provide the most appropriate code based on the information that you give us. And then, uh, we would map that within our system in time for you to submit your case. And then that would be included on the updated list the next month as an addition to our system. Thank you so much, Dr. Call. If a drug is approved in a different disease, would we see it on the report? So I can take that question. Um, yes, you would see it. Um, the, as I showed you, the um, the the diseases in the summary section are shown as either approved in this disease or approved in this indication, or we do also show uh, drugs that are approved in other indications. And the, each of them is shown with a level of evidence, so you can understand um, if it's a level C.1 that the drug is approved for that specific biomarker in a different disease um, versus a C.2 or a level D where there it's a um, criteria for a clinical trial or there's preclinical evidence for the use of that drug. But yes, we do include drugs that are both approved on indication and off indication. Thank you, Dr. Elkin. Can you select clinical trials and QCI, <clears throat> excuse me, QCI precision insights based on the patient's location? And the second part is where do the trials come from and how often is that information updated? I can go ahead and take that one. Um, the patient location can be indicated by either patient state or physician zip code, and that information would be submitted with the case um, via the XML. Um, and trials, uh, we find our trials primarily on clinicaltrials.gov and the WHO sites, uh, and we can also bring in trials from other databases and private sources as well. Um, as far as updating. Um, the clinicaltrials.gov trials are updated on a nightly basis in our system, and the WHO trials are updated on a regular basis, but uh, less frequent than nightly. Thank you, Dr. Call. And I want to remind our audience, you know, we are getting some amazing questions coming in. Any questions that we don't have time for today will be answered 
via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration, so please feel free to keep these questions coming in. Moving on to our next one. What kind of variants can QCI Precision Insights process and interpret, and what data files can be uploaded? Um, I can take that question. So mo QCI Precision Insights can interpret basically any kind of molecular result that you can submit. Um, we can take any kind of NGS variant, so um, single nucleotide variants, small indels, structural variants, fusions, rearrangements, copy number variants. We can also take cytogenetic variants and FISH. Um, we'll, IHC will work with our clients to ensure that we're using a consistent controlled vocabulary so that we're um, certain that for variants that aren't described by HGVS that we um, are in agreement on um, the nomenclature for the communication um, of those variants. Um, in terms of what kinds of data files can be uploaded, um, we work with our clients to define um, an XML input. So um, we work with you to take your VCF or your, um, your, your data file and submit it to us in a standardized XML input um, so that uh, with allowing us to be able to take not only uh, DNA sequencing results, but also the as I mentioned, the cytogenetic or FISH or IHC results as well, um, in addition to the diagnosis of the patient um, and the demographic information, the age and uh, gender um, that would also be used to, um, to filter the clinical trials. Thank you, Dr. Elkin. Our next question. How long does it take for the professional interpretation service to provide me with inter uh, interpretive comments? I can go ahead and take this one. Um, we, we do have a fully automated service that returns reports within minutes, uh, which we would contract for um, certain panels. And we also have an on-demand curation service where turnaround time varies based on the panel and the disease. Um, the longest contracted turnaround time would be up to three business days, um, but some reports would still be returned within minutes, and on average, our turnaround time for the curation service is about a half a day on average overall. Thank you, Dr. Call. So we have time for a few more questions. How are the oncologists involved in the process validating the clinical evidence in the interpretation summaries? So uh, we have a fantastic team of oncologists that have been working with us for a very long time. Um, and over the years, we've um, made that process more and more um, streamlined. So um, we have, they, they, the oncologists review each of the individual annotations that refer to clinical evidence or um, any kind of clinical information um, and al also answer any additional questions that our um, curators have or our scientists have in the process of their research. So they are um, working with us on a daily basis. We, um, we have an automated system to alert them when um, there are uh, annotations ready for their review. Um, and we also reach out to them ad hoc to get their clinical input on the um, information that we're providing. Thank you, Dr. Elkin. And it looks like we've got time for one more question. Is it possible to configure the final report? So yes, um, our report outputs are can be um, available either by XML or by PDF. Uh, the PDF is a standardized PDF um, that you would be able to attach to your report um, as, an, as an appendix or an addition. Um, and we're able to do things like change the logo, and but not um, there's not a lot of configuration available with that particular PDF. However, we also provide the information by XML, um, and in the XML version, um, you would be able to parse that information in whatever way you wanted to do, um, so that uh, you know you can use whatever pieces of information from the XML and display them in a way that that you can customize yourself to, to um, you know, preserve a brand or, or make your reports unique. Um, Kaijin does also have report services that can help with, with reporting if, if necessary. 
thank you again, Dr. Elkin and Dr. Call for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank Leverts and our sponsor, Kyogen, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye, everyone.